SpongeBob Battle for Bikini Bottom is one of my favorite games. It's a solid 3D platformer that represents SpongeBob wonderfully. Shockingly enough, despite being a children's licensed game, it got a remake a couple years ago in the form of Rehydrated. It was... good. It's a more than decent way to play the game with many quality of life additions and a great visual update. The thing that held it back for me was the lack of polish. If it was just in the oven for a little bit longer, I'm sure it'd be the best way to play the game. The developers behind it, Purple Lamp Studios, are wonderful though. I think they did an insanely impressive job for the time they were given. However, with this era of older games coming back in the form of remakes, to be then given a whole new entry, I was just counting down the days until we finally get a new Spongebob game in the style of Battle for Bikini Bottom. After some months of teasing, on September 17th, 2021, it happened. A spiritual successor to Battle for Bikini Bottom was announced, Spongebob Squarepants The Cosmic Shake. I won't lie, I teared up when I saw this trailer. It may have only been a CG trailer, but the promise of expanding on what BFBB has already done combined with these really cool concepts loading into the brim of references to the show, and with sweet victory, yeah, dude, that's scientifically engineered to get an emotional response from me. It would take a while to actually see anything, but man, when we did, it looked awesome. It truly looked like that sequel to Battle for Bikini Bottom I've always wanted. Yes, I know the movie game exists, by the way, but aside from using the same framework, I do not see it as a sequel. This, though, absolutely. It's also just been a while since the last original console SpongeBob game, and that one was actual garbage. Oh my god, look at this. And it's finally here, and obviously it's a huge priority for me, so much so that I skipped every other SpongeBob game and delayed that Sonic Marathon even further for this video. Uh, don't worry, I will cover the other SpongeBob games eventually, and I will get back to Sonic 1 after this, but for now, I just wanted to gush about this game because I kind of love it. For this video, I'm focusing on the PC version released on Steam. So, uh, let's get started. Cosmic Shake opens up with Spongebob waking up from his foghorn alarm clock, ready to go to Club World with Patrick. After a slight delay, they go in after a couple hours meet up with this mermaid named Madame Cassandra. She's hosting a garage sale thing, I guess, and Spongebob finds this thing called the Mermaid Tears. It's magical bubble soap that allows you to make any wish just by blowing a bubble. Spongebob takes it home and goes to town with it for seemingly everyone in Bikini Bottom, until learning that this is the property of King Neptune and it's not meant for mortals, otherwise disastrous consequences will happen. Said disastrous consequences happen, and most of the citizens of Bikini Bottom get sucked into wish portals, taking them to alternate versions of Bikini Bottom, where their wishes came true, while also heavily altering their lives in Bikini Bottom itself. The real Bikini Bottom now in ruin and Patrick now ballooned because of his own wish, Spongebob now has to save Bikini Bottom and undo his damage, with a questionable guidance from Madame Cassandra. Yeah, they pull a crash too by having the villain help the protagonist by tricking the hero into helping them do bad things. No, this isn't a spoiler. They're not at all subtle about this. She's telling him to get as much jelly as she can, which are these little globs you collect throughout the game. Saying that you need them to open up more portals, but really she obviously has other plans with them in mind. This is a fun plot. I love Spongebob and Patrick's extreme naivete, ignoring all the obvious red flags radiating off of Cassandra. Cassandra herself being cool, she has this really strong design. I like her interactions with Spongebob and Patrick a lot. Their dynamic is fun with Cassandra doing a terrible job hiding her bad intentions and Spongebob and Patrick just believing her. I especially like how she gets really annoyed when Spongebob wants to help others when they're just delaying his jelly gathering. That's some really good character writing right there. She's an original character for this game too. Purple Lamp did a great job on her. As for the gameplay, like I've made clear earlier, the game is very inspired by Battle for Bikini Bottom. It's noticeably more linear with this level design and even its structure, ditching its collectathon roots in favor of linear event-focused approach. Otherwise, yeah, it's Battle for Bikini Bottom. The controls are almost identical to Rehydrated, there's tongue sliding, various moves and obstacles are pulled from the game, the combat is near identical, they have introduction cutscenes for every enemy type. The basic approach to level design is very similar with a focus on linear design that occasionally opens up more, and it even has tikis. Yeah, almost all tiki types are present in this, excluding the sh tikis, which I would assume is because Spongebob can't tiptoe. They're noticeably bigger too, which confused me until I realized how much more often you platform on these in the game. 
Unfortunately, there aren't any new ones, which is pretty disappointing, not gonna lie. Another thing some might find disappointing is how Spongebob is the only playable character. Patrick now being a balloon and all is sort of this game's navvy, guiding you where you need to go. A little ironic that Patrick fulfills that role now that I'm saying that out loud. Anyway, Patrick's a guide character and Sandy is in the game, but no more important than any other NPC. I honestly don't mind this. It's cool being able to play as other characters, don't get me wrong. But in BFBB specifically, Patrick was the least fun to play as and I'm just kind of not a big fan of Sandy's character. It's just hard for me to see this as that big of a downgrade because of that, especially when they actually incorporated some of Sandy's moves into Spongebob's moveset. I'm not at all against playable characters, it's just that I'm kind of indifferent to how BFBB handled that, so yeah, I, I just, I don't care. I think I might have said otherwise in my original BFBB video, but that was also like four years ago, so yeah, opinions change. Oh yeah, there's also the fact that this is generally just done to add variety, but this game has so much variety as is, it really didn't need other playable characters. To talk about these things a little more in depth, let's start with the things from BFBB. Tongue sliding is back, and it's... fine. The courses are very wide and don't have a lot of turns, so it's all really easy. While at least the original BFBB, the slide sections can actually be kind of brutal. They're still fun, but it's a definite downgrade. You can also slide upwards, and this feels all kinds of wrong. SpongeBob's bubble wand swing works identically to how it did in Rehydrated, except it's a net. You can even still do that thing where you extend your jump length by swinging your net at the peak of your jump. The combat is super similar too, mostly being really easy to understand with this challenge coming from more so avoiding enemy attacks and using the right move to take them down. This is in some ways better than BFBB's combat and in other ways worse. It's better because Spongebob has much greater movement variety having a dodge roll, a bubble that can stun enemies, a homing attack, and more. It's worse because there's a stronger emphasis on it. BFBB's combat was good for what it was, very simple, but also was brief enough to avoid being repetitive. Here's there's multiple enemies that take multiple hits, often with long gaps between opportunities to attack, and they force it a lot by putting borders around the arenas. I also find fighting these jelly-generating monsters weird because you have to dodge roll to avoid getting stunned, and I find the most efficient way is to just awkwardly roll into him so you're closer to him for your next hit, and yeah, it's jank. The combat having more of an emphasis than it should is not a huge deal. These are still brief sections, but BFBB undeniably had a better balance. And yeah, it, it does bring the game down a little. As for the new stuff, the game has some cool stuff too. You get this gliding ability where Spongebob pulls out a Krusty Krab pizza box to gently flow down. I absolutely love the idea and reference, but I really wish the pizza turned into a parachute like the actual episode. This just looks kind of weird. It would serve as a much better reference and would just make it more sense. It's a fun ability, but I surprisingly didn't find myself using it too much. It's required for a lot of big gaps, but I don't know if it's ever required for any smaller jumps. I'd imagine that was an intentional design decision to keep the game easy enough for them youngins. I didn't really use it outside of when it was required, but I'm sure it's great if you're not confident in your jumps. You also have the dodge roll, and it does exactly what you think it does. You're completely invincible when you're doing it, so it's honestly pretty broken, but whatever. It's fun stringing these together with jumps so you can go just a little faster. Aside from those moves in the jellyfishing net that works exactly like the bubble wand from BFBB that I already mentioned, and I guess the obligatory double jump and ground pound, those are the basic moves. You do unlock more throughout the game, though. My favorite is definitely the karate kick from the second level. It's literally just Sonic's homing attack, and it's both really funny seeing Spongebob do it and really satisfying to pull off. I love zipping across large distances to kick enemies in the face. The Bubble Bowl sort of returned from BFBB. It uses the same sound effect and has similar results, but instead of gliding across the ground, it goes straight through the air. Or, uh, water, I guess. And it homes in on enemies when they're around and stuns them. I love using it to destroy Thunder Tiki's from a distance, it feels really good to pull that off. Sandy's dumb old Texas swinging is basically back, but in the form of Spongebob swinging on the hooks! The hooks! They're just as automated as rehydrated swinging unfortunately, but it's still fun. There's plenty of other moves that I admittedly don't have a ton to say about, like the bubble surfboard, rolling on giant rocks, using a reflower to suck up and then blow things out. They're still all fun and have variety, I just feel like they speak for themselves, I don't have much to add. 
Other than your moves, you're also just doing a lot. Chugging Cactus Jukes, flipping Krabby Patties, riding a seahorse, playing a classic side-scrolling beat-em-up, and riding Spongebob's unicycle. A few of these are nothing special, really just quick-time events, but they add charm and that's enough for me. Riding Mystery Around is a little disappointing though. I thought it controlled pretty poorly until I figured out what was actually happening. I was expecting it to play like an animal riding level from Crash, but it's much closer to the rail grinding sections from the Boost Sonic games. You only have three lanes to work with, just like Sonic. I suppose that's fine, but I think something closer to Crash would have been more fun, and it would have just read better too. Like, this looks like it plays like this, so when it actually plays like this, it just feels worse than it actually is. The unicycle section works in the same way, but since the road is far less dynamic, it's way easier to tell you're only working with a few lanes. I don't dislike these sections, because they, they at least look cool, but they could have been more fun, definitely. As for the actual level design, yeah, this game is more linear. BFBB was linear for a clutch-a-thon, but still had plenty of open areas. Those do exist in Cosmic Shake, but they're not very common, which is fine. The game favors focusing on platforming and giving context to why you're doing anything over collecting a bunch of things to reach that almighty number. So yeah, more linear levels makes total sense for this game. I definitely have a preference for BFBB's collectathon structure, but this is great too. The game does have collectibles, however, they are greatly understated. I'd say there are like maybe three main collectibles doubloons, jelly, and golden spatulas, returning from battle for Bikini Bottom. They do nothing. No, seriously, there's one golden spatula per level, and the only thing you get for getting them all is an achievement. That's it. Like I said, you collect a lot of jelly in this game. They're used exclusively to buy more costumes, and that's it, which is fine, but they're so abundant. I had like 15,000 more than I needed by the time I beat the game. So yeah, that's too much. I do greatly prefer that over requiring grinding them, though. Another collectible are the doubloons, and these are at least a little useful. Get enough of them and you have another tier of costumes to buy, with each tier getting more and more expensive. You get doubloons from doing its various challenges in each level by finding them or by completing quests given out by NPCs. The challenges are enjoyable, they usually focus on things like platforming, surfing through hoops, killing enemies, or just finding them hidden somewhere. I like looking for these a lot, I just really don't like how you can't get all of these in your first go around. You unlock different abilities as you play through the game, so you're expected to go back to these levels later. The problem is that these are linear levels, so unless you somehow manage to remember where each of these challenges are and know which checkpoint to warp to, which yeah, good luck because there's a lot of them, you're gonna be playing through these levels twice. Yeah, there's no portrait showing where the warps are by the way, really strange considering Rehydrated added that. Having to basically replay levels is already annoying, but the quests NPCs and hub give you make it worse. The way these work is characters will ask you to collect X number of things in X level, but with the exception of most of Plankton's quests, these always happen after you beat the level. So even if you do somehow remember each challenge you can't do on your initial playthrough, there's no way you'll know where these are. Meaning that you have to play through each level at least twice, even if your memory is perfect or you write things down, I guess. This is just padding and I'm not a fan. I don't mind too much on this playthrough because I really enjoyed this game, but I'm not sure if I'm ever going to go for 100% again. These quests only give you doubloons too, so they're really not worth it unless you have to go for 100%. Actually, I'd say that about any doubloon that requires you to revisit levels, considering not a single one is required for anything beyond costumes. Like, costumes are a cool reward, but it's not cool enough to justify going that out of your way for. One quest I don't mind is finding Spot. Spot is Plankton's pet amoeba first introduced in Season 9. I'd actually recommend these Spot-focused episodes. They're some of the better modern episodes of the show. And they're also really cute. Anyway, in each level, there's one hidden Spot. Spot. The reward is the same as any other quest, just a single doubloon. But you do get the quest after the first level, so there's very little backtracking. That and Spot is cute, and Plankton deserves some happiness. He's not very hard to find either, Spongebob will typically mention Spot whenever you're close. I personally only missed one, and I'm not really sure how even that happened. There's also collectibles in the hub itself, Patrick's giant sticky notes. They're based off of that one gag from the Bubble Buddy episode. 
That's such a ridiculously specific thing to make a whole collectible on, and I love it. These are actually really fun to get, the hub being a lot more open than any other part of the game, it just makes it more fun to explore. Once again, it's all for a single doubloon, but that doesn't take away how much fun I had exploring the hub for these. Every level has their own collectible, like Medieval Silver Fields has ingredients to cure Gary's transformation. Halloween Rock Bottom has good noodle stars for Mrs. Puff, another good reference. Pirate Goo Lagoon has pennies for Mr. Krabs, and so on. I enjoy how each collectible is tied to their character in some way, but they're all effectively the same quest that all give the same reward. Doubloons. So yeah, when you break it down, there's not a lot of collectibles in this game. Really just doubloons, jelly, two pairs of golden underwear that upgrades your health, and golden spatulas. One gives you nothing, two gives you costumes, and one other is so rare that I had to modify this part of the script because I actually almost forgot it. Any other collectible just gives you more doubloons. It's weird to have these in and all if they're just not gonna do anything really. Like, I know that this isn't a collectathon, but if you're gonna have collectibles, make them do something. As for the costumes, the thing you get doubloons for, they're actually kinda awesome. You get a good few through natural story progression, but the vast majority are gone through the shop. Almost all of them are references to the show. There's a lot of deep cuts here, like the skeleton that has to work with the Krusty Krab. FOREVER! The elf costume from that one gag from the episode that was banned because Mr. Krabs panty raids his mom's drawers. The clown afro from the Salty Spittoon episode. The haunted mattress from Scaredy Pants. The goofy goober wizard costume from the movie. A lot of other references I don't get because I'm really only a fan of the first three seasons. They even have Spongebob with his army helmet from BFBB. I especially like that one because I love seeing that in something other than the box art. There is a lot here. So many of these were only in the show for less than 5 seconds and I find that amazing. They even have Rainbow Bob, a costume that originates from a Pride Month tweet. The fact that they pulled from a tweet is so cool to me. They even have the maid outfit from when Squidward enslaved Spongebob! If you pre-ordered the game, you even got a few bonus costumes like Spongebob Steel Pants and Dehydrated Spongebob, both from Battle for Bikini Bottom. There's also the marching band outfit from Band Geeks, Primitive Sponge from SB129, Opposite Days, Squidward, and more. You can still get these if you didn't pre-order. For $10? Yeah, I don't think you need me to say this, but don't pay full price for this. They're great costumes, some of my favorites even, but no. And of course, you get costumes from specific levels and general game progression. They're all themed towards the level you're in. The pirate costume for the pirate level, the cowboy costume for the wild west level, the flower costume for the Halloween level- wait, what? This costume is from the episode Krabby Land, so what's the connection here? This one confuses me. There's like three costumes that would have fit just fine here. This is the one level where I didn't wear the default costume and I, I just found it to be too ill-fitting. Though I should point out that if you do this, Spongebob unfortunately reverts back to the appropriate costume for the level for the cutscenes. I would assume to avoid clipping. Anyway, yeah, most of these costumes are references too, like we got his Pest of the West get up for Wild West Jellyfish Fields. Weirdly, for Medieval Sulphur Fields, they pulled Squidward's Jester outfit from Dunces and Dragons instead of Spongebob's armor, but whatever. We also got Spongegar from Ugg for Prehistoric Kelp Forest and more. The levels themselves are also frequently based off of episodes, which actually kind of worried me because they pull a lot from season 4 and 5, and I'm not really a fan of those seasons. Seeing a lot of Karate Island in the teasers worried me because I actually kind of hate that episode. It's absolutely not the worst, no, the show goes far lower, but it's my least favorite episode because it's the one that would make me change the channel as a kid. It's so boring and the character designs are just gross and don't fit the show, yeah, I, I hate it. We also have a Pest of the West level, that's a season 5 episode, and I think that one's fine. A couple good jokes, and it's cool to look at, but still not a great episode. Controversial, but I don't even like Dunces and Dragons. The pacing is weirdly fast, and I just don't think it's funny, except for that suicide joke, that one's good. Seeing a joke like that come from Spongebob makes it ten times funnier. I do have a lot of really good memories tied to the Burger King promotion that they had at the time. They made a ton of different Spongebob figures that are supposed to represent different parts of the world, and I still think that was the coolest fast food promotion I have ever seen. Even if I know I really annoyed my parents at the time because I was trying so hard to get every figure. The one classic era episode they did pull from happens to be one of the few episodes I'm just not into. Ugh. 
I love the visuals. It's super cool seeing Bikini Bottom reimagined like this, but otherwise it's just kind of boring. I know that these episodes specifically were picked because they match the game's Wish Worlds concept well. It's just kind of a shame I'm not really into the original episodes. Thankfully, these really are just loosely inspired. I was very pleased to see that Karate Island's inspiration is very minimal, and is really just used for that boss fight. Pets of the West, Dunces and Dragons, and Ugg are definitely pulled far more from. But still, not a ton. It really just comes down to using the same theming, which is the part of those episodes I did like. Aside from that, we also have Karate, Downtown, Bikini Bottom, Pirate, Goo Lagoon, Halloween, Rock Bottom, Prehistoric, Kelp Forest, Medieval, Sulphur Fields, and Jelly Glove World. Interesting thing is, most of these levels are in Battle for Bikini Bottom in their unaltered form, and the level order is even the same, minus missing some levels and some additions. I don't see this as an issue though, they all feel very different from their BFBB counterparts to a point where most of them feel entirely different. I love how they took Sulphur Fields, an area that was only briefly in the episode pre-Hibernation Week, and made it a whole level similar to how BFBB did that with Industrial Park. Well, uh, except that was a boss arena, but shut up. That has to be intentional, right? All these levels are really great and they all have their own fun stories going on. Big fan. Wild West Jellyfish Fields I feel is a much stronger first level than BFBB's Jellyfish Fields, with much stronger platforming and a fun scenario to follow. SpongeBob and Patrick go in to find Mr. Krabs to eventually, and I really, really do mean eventually, discover that he's a famous bandit in this world. They seem to have a problem trusting too easily in this game, I guess. This level has a lot of fun areas like a small town with a saloon, Mrs. Puff Seahorse Riding School, and a mine shaft with an Alaskan bullworm! Okay, they don't actually show it, they just mention it, so it's, it's a little lame. I love how the platforming section leading up to that part has these puffer fish from BFBB's jellyfish fields. It's so nice seeing those guys used in a much more meaningful way. In retrospect, it's so weird how you only see it used once in such a nothing obstacle. This right here, this is so much better. The next level is Karate Downtown Bikini Bottom. This one might be my favorite. It's about filming a karate movie with Squidward being the directed and actually very respected but hard to work with one who demands absolute perfection. I kind of love any level that's themed around filming a movie. Hat in Time is another excellent example and I loved it here too. They use this as an excuse to add a ton of variety, like having Spongebob pose for the paparazzi, filming an action scene on Spongebob's unicycle, saving various bikini monomites, and even an arcade-style beat-em-up. I especially love platforming on the construction stuff at the end, which reminds me a lot of Downtown Bikini Bottom from Revenge of the Flying Dutchman, but you know, good. This is a level that ends with the Karate Island stuff, but none of the stuff I actually disliked about that episode are present, so it's harmless. We need crash, boom, bang! Pirate Goo Lagoon is another great one. Not very Goo Lagoon looking, but it's very pirate. This one has... Brawn! Oh my god, he's back. I lost my mind when he appeared in a recent episode. I lost my mind here. Oh, I'm so happy. Anyway, this level has Prawn shooting out exploding pies from dying for pie. Oh my god, this game speaks to me. It's another fun level with some very cool set pieces and Patrick crushing on a mermaid, which I guess is just a thing he does. Next is Halloween Rock Bottom. This one's about Gary's disappearance, and there's apparently a monster on the loose, only for Gary to be the monster. Apparently not responding very well to Candy. Oh my, oh my god, I'm just now making this connection. Did they... D is that one bus stop gag with the candy machine the inspiration for this whole level concept? Wow. Anyway, this is another good one. It has some stealth sections that can be very easily ignored, so that's a pointless mechanic. But otherwise, a fun level with cool theming. It references the episode I Was a Teenage Gary, which is the only episode in the classic era I straight up dislike and skip on rewatches, but it more than makes up for it with the hatch slinging slasher puzzle. Oh my god, yes. Oh my god, guys, I love Spongebob. I don't know if I made that clear. I love Spongebob. I love it. They got the Spongebob scaredy pants spider in this really out of the way spot. This is such a good easter egg. Dude, dude, they, they remade the rock bottom bus stop gag from BFBB and it's a lot better. Oh, this is a good level. I, I like it. 
Prehistoric Kelp Forest is the next one, and this one was almost my favorite for its theming alone. I love the way this place looks, it's amazing seeing one of my favorite looking episodes translated into a full level in a video game. It even has sea bears! My only problems are that they call Squidward Squidward instead of Squag, while Spongebob and Patrick are still referred to as Spongegar and Patar. Boy, I hope someone got fired for that blunder. Oh, it is weirdly short too. Most levels in this game took me close to an hour, but this one only lasted about 30 minutes. Kind of a shame, I wanted more of this. But hey, you roll on boulders through lava and wake this thing up from the beginning of UGG, so it's, it's a cool level that I like still. My other possible favorite level is Medieval Sulphur Fields. I just feel like this one has the most variety in locales. You start in a rainbow in the sky, then you're platforming outside a castle, then you're in a hedge maze, then you're in a market town, then deep inside a jungle, and so on. It does admittedly have a little bit of a flaccid ending with a pretty simple platforming sequence and an annoying challenge instead of a boss fight. But that's it! This was a great level other than that. The last level is Jelly Glove World, where the game began, but, uh, jellied. This one starts off with Patrick disappearing, but what's really funny about that is if you leave the level and go to a different one, the game will pretend Patrick is still around despite being not. Probably would have been a good idea to just not allow Spongebob to leave until the level's over. Aside from that, this is cool. I love the creepy atmosphere, and I really like the friendship Glovey Glove is forcing on Patrick. Seeing all of Spongebob's and Patrick's photos being poorly edited to have Glovey Glove replacing Spongebob plastered all over the walls is a cool touch. Hearing his insane ramblings, blaming Spongebob for the loss of his theme park, and lying about Patrick not wanting to be his friend anymore throughout the level is actually kind of creepy. What brings this even further is how you can see that everyone who was at the park when everything went down is just now trapped here and are genuine prisoners. You can also ride the mitten and pop balloons. Yeah, this level rules. Oh, oh yeah, I guess I should talk about the hub too before I forget. Yeah, the hub is good. I think I still prefer BFBB's hub for how much more confined it is and how every collectible are actually valuable things to get in the game, but I still like this one a lot. I love how it slowly improves as you play through the game and fix Bikini Bottom. Things become less ruined, buildings come back and more open up. I am a huge fan when games do stuff like this, and this is now one of my favorite examples. The hub is also just fun to explore. Yeah, the collectibles don't do a lot, but I still had a good time finding them all. I don't like how much empty space there is, though. They do give you seahorses to mitigate that, but that's more of a band-aid solution, and I would have definitely preferred if they just not make it empty. Also, the way the game handles out-of-bounds areas in this hub is weird. They use both invisible walls and voiding the player out, like BFBB minus the fun animation. Use one or the other, using both feels so messy and jank. Especially when it's in one spot like this. Oh, and uh, this is definitely a preference thing, but I'm not a fan of when hubs have enemies in them because I prefer hubs to remain safe areas. I just feel like that's part of the appeal. But again, that's a subjective thing, and it did make certain tedious achievements much easier. The visuals of this game are also really nice, being even better than Rehydrated. You can still tell the game has a lower budget than other games, but it still looks nice regardless. It's very vibrant, nice lighting, and the character models all look great. SpongeBob still uses his Rehydrated model, which I still think is too wide, but I don't mind it nearly as much because I don't have an older game to compare it to. The animation also got a huge improvement from Rehydrated. Rehydrated's animations were fine, but this isn't too far off from what Toys for Bob are doing with Crash. It's so expressive and fits SpongeBob wonderfully. The game as a whole, at least from my experience, is definitely far more polished than Rehydrated too. I had very little happen to me, really just an annoying glitch that slowed Spongebob way down and I had to die to fix it. The music would also frequently refuse to play if I died in a fight, which, yeah, not, not great. This stuff is annoying, but honestly I had so much more happen to me at Rehydrated. I had way more happen to me in my first Rehydrated playthrough. It still has some issues like texture pop in, but it's way less of an issue here. At least on my PC. This is just from my experience though, I've seen other glitches happen to other people, but it didn't happen to me, so it's feasible you'll have a relatively solid playthrough is all I'm saying. Not to mention, they've apparently released multiple big patches since I last played the game. I can't really say to what extent these patches fixed the game, especially since I didn't have much happen to me to begin with. 
but I've heard they're big, and from what little I have experienced, you can actually set the graphical settings now in the PC version, which was not a thing before and still isn't a thing for Rehydrated, so that's really cool. The writing is surprisingly good too. I didn't expect to find this game to be funny because I don't like the new episodes, but there's some good stuff here. It's far from the quality of the old episodes, and it's very likely I'm a lot nicer to this game's writing than the shows because an occasional good joke isn't enough for a TV show. But it is for a game because that's not what makes me enjoy a game, it just helps. But regardless, I like more jokes here than I thought I would. I love this one loading screen later joke and this other joke where it looks like Spongebob is about to haphazardly jump onto the seahorse, but then he calmly pulls out his license making the seahorse pull out his monocle to carefully read it. That's good, I like that. I love this joke about stealing candy from babies in Halloween Rock Bottom. There's only one way to get the amount of candy we need. Take it from babies? No, we go trick-or-treating. Oh, uh, that works too, I guess. The writing isn't what I call amazing, personally. There's plenty of stuff I didn't laugh at, and they even kept some of those gross-out shots I've never been a fan of. But they were very few jokes I outright disliked and even laughed at a good number of them. Battle for Bikini Bottom isn't a super funny game either, in my opinion. Just like this one, really just having its moments, but I think I like the writing in Cosmic Shake more. That's definitely partly because there's a lot more focus on cutscenes and they make more of an effort to make the game feel like the show by including things like time cards and the show's background music. I'm kinda surprised that it took this long for a Spongebob game to have this. It seems so obvious in retrospect, but I somehow never thought about this. The time cards are fun and handled well, but the background music isn't timed well at all. It has a lot of abrupt cuts and just feels kind of forced and all around. Still a good inclusion, but yeah, it could have been handled better. I get the sense that these were a late addition. When the game was first announced, they hyped up Sweet Victory's inclusion and I was really hoping they make a level themed around the Bubble Bowl scene, but no, it's just used for the credits. That and Stadium Rave, admittedly these are my two favorite songs in the series so if they're gonna use something for the credits I'm glad it was that but did they really have to hype it up like that? They did the same thing with Rehydrated where they were making a big deal about bringing back cut content but it turned out it was all purely for this terrible horde mode. Like yeah they're technically not lying in both of these cases but it's absolutely still dishonest. I'm just gonna stop trusting the things these people say. They're great devs, but it sucks feeling disappointed from stuff like this. The game does have plenty of original music too, and it's good. They brought back the original composers of Battle for Bikini Bottom, which got me so excited. I overall prefer their work on both BFBB and the movie game, but this is still some good stuff. Wild West Jellyfish Fields is part remix of Jellyfish Fields from BFBB, and it fits the western theming super well. Pirate Goo Lagoon has this sea shanty vibe and it's really catchy. I had this one stuck in my head for hours after I recorded that session. Medieval Sulphur Fields might be my favorite song in the game. This is another one that got stuck in my head. It's dynamic too, so the intensity changes depending on what you're doing. Like if you're fighting or just standing still. I'm a big fan of when games do this, and this is no exception. Admittedly, not a lot of other songs stood out a ton, but I still enjoyed these songs quite a bit, and the other ones were all very serviceable. 
the boss fights in this game are pretty typical. All decent, but none of them really stood out all that much to me. I like the Mr. Krabs' bandit chase because chasing down a train and boarding it is inherently cool, but it just becomes a super basic platforming sequence when you board the train. Hat in time, this is not. Pearls was kinda cool because I like that they translated her waterfall tears from the show into an attack, but I uh, still thought it was just fine. Like a very typical 3D platformer fight. Gary's probably stands out the most because it involves stealth. You gotta wait behind something whenever his eyes scan over you and destroy his candy supply. I don't think it's especially fun, but it's at least more different than the typical wait through the attack design that almost every other boss has. It's especially annoying in the Sandy fight because if you miss your chance, you gotta wait another minute or so. Going for the achievements sucked in these two, they're not hard, but they're the kind of achievements that require a reset if you fail and you can't just leave in a menu or something. There's no retry option and the game outright forbids you from leaving a boss. You either have to beat the boss and then retry, or just leave the game itself, it's just annoying. BFB definitely had better bosses, especially that game's final boss. Yeah, the final boss for Cosmic Shake is... meh. Madame Cassandra jellies up Squidward using him as a weapon. The fight is basically a retread of Glovey Gloves fight, which is a fight I had so little to say about that I didn't even bring it up. Use a reef blower to suck up enemies and blow them back at her. It's fine. Once she's defeated, King Neptune congratulates SpongeBob. Patrick and Squidward turn back to normal and King Neptune offers SpongeBob one wish. Patrick then wishes to do it again and I guess the game repeats kind of like the bad ending in Sonic CD. Sweet victory. It's a Spongebob game, so I can only care so much, but the ending definitely felt really rushed. And I'm not just saying that because I rode a seahorse there, causing it to appear in the cutscene, ruining multiple shots. Cassandra's villain reveal cutscene just feels really... I don't know... tame? It's just kinda happening in the normal, happy hub. It would've been way better if she started wrecking her havoc before she announced to Spongebob and Patrick that she's evil. Doing it the way they did just feels lame. Like, this is the climax of the game, but this is objectively the happiest Bikini Bottom has been since the beginning of the game. She's also just kind of abruptly sucked up into a portal at the end of the fight too, to never be seen again. Aside from that very rushed ending... Guys... I love Cosmic Shake. I love this game. It's now one of my favorites, and I really mean that. It's yet another great 3D platformer SpongeBob game that uses its license wonderfully. It's loaded with great references, humor, and gameplay, and it just feels like SpongeBob. The additions of music from the show, high detail shots, and time cards did wonders to make this feel closer to the show than any other game has. It's also a really fun game. Not perfect, of course. But it's still a really solid one, which I feel like is the absolute most you can ask for from a Spongebob game. Just like Battle for Bikini Bottom, this is an easy recommendation to anyone who likes both Spongebob and platformers. But is it better than Battle for Bikini Bottom? That's a tough question. I think both games have their strengths. They both excel at being great Spongebob 3D platformers, but aside from that, I like both for different reasons. Bad Over Bikini Bottom is absolutely a better vanilla Spongebob game. The areas in the show are the areas you can expect in the game. It represents Spongebob's world a lot better, but Cosmic Shakes are a lot more creative and it'd be pretty boring if it just retry to those areas again. Other than that, Cosmic Shake has a better moveset with a lot more variety. Battle for Bikini Bottom's levels feel more fulfilling to explore with that game's collectibles actually meaning something. Cosmic Shake has a lot more variety in general, and in a good way. Battle for Bikini Bottom's bosses, while not all great, they have much higher highs. On a more subjective level, I prefer the collectathon structure in general, but I really like how Cosmic Shake is more cutscene and story driven. I like the heavier emphasis on writing and how each level has their own little story going on. I really can't say which one is better, I don't think there is an answer, I like both equally. At least I do now, opinions change and this game is still pretty new. But regardless of how I feel about this game later, if I'm genuinely unsure on which one I like more while comparing it to one of my favorite games ever, Cosmic Shake is clearly doing something very, very right. 
So yeah, obviously I love this game and I highly recommend it if you're a Spongebob fan. Both because the game is great and also because if this game sells well, we get more. Purple Lamp has already stated that they want to make more Spongebob stuff. They have more ideas and I want to see that stuff happen. Seriously, this is almost exactly what I wanted a Battle for Bikini Bottom sequel to be. And I have it. This is literally one of my dream games and it's about as good as I could have possibly wanted. I am so happy. I now consider Purple Lamp Studios to be the new Heavy Iron and that is literally the best compliment I could possibly give to Spongebob game developers. Okay, so before I end this video, I kind of want to talk about the obvious that I've been gone for a year again and uh, that Sonic video still isn't out even though I said it'll be my next video. Long story short, that video ended up being way bigger than I had ever imagined. Uh, like, it's probably going to be about an hour and 40 minutes. When I made my Hat in Time video, I didn't think anything would ever surpass that. And I especially didn't think Sonic the Hedgehog on the Sega Genesis would do that, but it did. <laughs> uh, I have a lot to say about Sonic, apparently. Um, and uh, I'm also covering like every major re-release of the game, and I'm sure that's a part of it. But yeah, that video ended up being longer than I thought it would be, uh, so that's kind of why I've been gone for so long. Also, I wanted to get that done before Cosmic Shake came out, but then I got COVID and was out for a month. I'm fine, by the way, but it sucked during that time. I just couldn't work on the video. Uh, in fact, fun fact, almost all of the gameplay you see in this video, I recorded when I had COVID. <laughs> in fact, I have a distinct memory of coughing out a lung while recording uh, Medieval Sulphur Fields. My mom texted me asking if I was okay. <laughs> but yeah, since I wasn't able to get it done in time, I kind of just killed my motivation in general. And yeah, but I, I promise um, I will get back to Sonic 1 after this. And I don't... <laughs> I, the other videos uh, in the Sonic Marathon will not take nearly as long. Sonic 1 is the game where I explain all the gameplay mechanics and it's one with the most amount of ports. So yeah, that's why that's so long. The other videos will not be nearly as long and therefore will not take as long. I promise I will not spend seven years in this marathon. But yeah, uh, regardless, I hope you enjoyed this video. I worked hard on it and I especially hope you enjoy my Sonic video whenever that comes out. So, uh, bye!